leave a like and subscribe. On March the 5th, 1969, identical twins, Reginald and Ronald Cray, were sentenced to life imprisonment. They were 35 years old. Summing up, Justice Melford Stevenson said, I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities, and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. They commanded a hell of a lot of respect. The name was very, very well known and very, very feared. I can assure you of that. Very feared. Charlie was a joking bloke, very nice fella. My opinion, never was a villain and never would have been a villain. Reggie, you look at him in his eyes, he, he smelled fear. And fear came on with Ronnie, you know oozed out of him. He had a, a smile, almost take you two ways, either he's smiling at you because you're going to get hurt, or he's smiling at you because he likes you. I mean, Ronnie would be laughing and joking about it. all of a sudden, he'd pick on you. My mother was simply a wonderful woman. No man ever had a finer mother. We often had no money and very little food, but she always made sure that Reggie and Charlie and I had something to eat and something half decent to wear. She never gave in to despair or frustration. Even when times were bleak and the future seemed to hold nothing, I would kill any man who spoke ill of my mother. I met them through Charlie their brother Charlie who was older than them and uh, then the twins were only young then but they was there was something about them that was destined for them to be uh, notorious you know because they was a bit unruly to say the least I remember the first time I went to their home they were out in the backyard punching the daylights out of each other you know and uh, the old man and Charlie had to go out and stop them but he used to say to me Charlie have a word with them you know, the twins, and see if he talk some sense into them. But of course, they were too young and fiery. They, they wouldn't listen to what you had to say. They'd go in one ear and out the other. They still do what they wanted to do. The craze had got something about them that was almost indefinable. To say that they were personalities is wrong because they projected an aura of evil, of power. They would resort to violence at the slightest provocation to establish a reputation. And this they did very, very successfully so that not only foreigners and people that intruded in the, into the East End, but members of their own gang respected them because of that violence. to everybody uh, in the East End, yes, they were. They called each other names and want to fight each other, but if you interfered, then you were the enemy, and the two of them would turn on you, you know, so you had to be very careful how you behaved around them. They thought they was untouchable, and uh, they thought I could get away with... Uh, it, you know, no one was going to give evidence against them. They only went into people that were breaking the law. You know, like if you had a publican who was having a laugh to timer, then they could go into him. Or if they had a club where they were doing illegal gambling, dice, spilling or something like that, they would go into them. They weren't their work. But no way could they ever go into straight people. Because the first, if they come in, the, the first thing you need to put the phone up, give it the police. And that was it.
This tremendous power to terrify was the Cray twins' greatest weapon. Just one, you just have to glare at some people when they shit themselves. Mm. That was one of his favourite tricks. He would sit in a sit in a pub or a club where we were, and people would be brought in for various reasons, and he could just sit there and stare at this person for half an hour. And that person would he hasn't said a word to him, but that person's gone away and thoroughly cowed, you know, been told off without a word. That was that was how much uh, fear that he generated. summer's evening and I realized that a car had drawn up immediately outside the door and looked outside it's a big American type car and a guy stepped out of the car put with his hand in his pocket as, as though he had a gun in his pocket and he sort of swept the street looking up and down and making sure that there was no one inside and then gave a signal and the back door opened and out stepped Ronnie Cray and I was amazed because he was dressed for all the world like a 1930s Chicago gangster. He had a long, long cashmere coat that reached to his ankles, tied in a loose uh, belt at the waist. Uh, his hair was greased and, and parted, and uh, he wore his glasses. And then he, he swept across the pavement and into the pub, and he looked to me like Al Capone without his fedora. People think that you've got a lot of money sorted away. We haven't, no, we haven't. Did you? I think that's, that's a good point. Did you ever um, put money away, thousands away, like people think? No. We spend all that money. Mm. Spend all that money and give it away. Okay, give it away. Share it and give it away. They were violent all right cool yeah um Ch charlie was different altogether charlie i respected for ron killing was not enough he wanted people to see him kill in cold blood and he wanted his brother to do it too i think they were so carried away by the role they got themselves into as gangster killers they had to do it for So Ron murdered George Cornell in the Blind Beggar pub. His bloodlust was sated for a while. But somehow it wasn't enough. He knew the taboo on killing had to be broken again on the crazed bloody road to fame. Ron boasted about having personally killed a man. He goaded Reg, saying that if he could kill, why couldn't his brother do the same? It was a thing with it with Reggie and Ronnie that if Ronnie did something, then he would like Reggie thought he had to do it as well. And that's how they was. He does it, I'll do it. Like, you know, you can do it, I can do it. Ron cracked up the pressure. He began taunting Reg in public. Ronnie shouting out to him, but if you're going to shoot anybody, make sure you shoot him in the head, like I did Cornell. Out loud. Maybe because of Ronnie killing uh, Cornell, he thought he had to kill, he had to do one and do a move as well. Reg, crazy with booze and grief, finally agreed to kill someone. And Reg, I've got to go and do something. I've got, I've got, he's winding me up, he's, he's driving me mad. I want to go and shoot something. Reg chose his victim. He would be a likeable Irish robber called Jack McVitie, nicknamed Jack the Hat, because he always wore one to cover his baldness. McVitie believed the craze had swindled them out of several thousand pounds. He told anyone who would listen he was going to shoot them. On October the 28th, 1966, members of the firm told McVitie there was a party at a private apartment. When he arrived, the twins were waiting. Reg was behind the door with a gun. Ron stuck a glass in McVitie's face. Reg tried to shoot McVitie in the head, but his gun jammed. He grabbed a kitchen knife and butchered McVitie brutally.
And so Jack the Hat McVitie was murdered by Reg because Ron pressured him to kill, just as he himself had done a few months before. Both twins were now killers and bonded in blood. McVitie's body was never found. The twins made sure all their victims simply disappeared off the face of the earth. The Cray twins' lives were now in crisis. Ron's desire to be a famous gangster ratcheted up the violence, and Reg was submissively going along with it. Reg felt the death of Jack the Hat would mean trouble, and it did. Unknown to the craze, London police were closing in. After the McVitie and Cornell murders, a top-secret investigation was being launched with orders to get the craze at all costs. Police got interested in them because I uh, only become really interested in them when they knew about the murders. That's when the police become very interested in the craze. The craze got wind of the investigation but it was already too late. On the morning of May the 9th, 1968, the criminal empire of London's most feared gangsters would crash around them. A special police task force had patched together evidence linking the craze to the murders of George Cornell and Jack the Hat McVitie. Police surrounded the tower block the Crays had lived in since the old family house had been demolished less than a year before. At six in the morning, the police raced into the building and smashed open the door of the Crays' apartment. Reg and Ron were surprised in their beds and arrested. The Crays' ten-year reign of terror was finally over, but their legend was only beginning. In 1968, London's most notorious gangsters, the Cray Twins, were finally brought to justice. Throughout their lives, they had stuck together, plotted together, fought together, even killed together. And now, they were going to prison together. The Cray's trial created a sensation. I was very shocked by the change in their appearance because you could see Reggie's life was written on his face and he wasn't happy. He wasn't enjoying it at all. I think he was terrified. He knew that he was not going to see the light of day again. Oh, Ronnie was off to the moon. He really didn't have a clue what was happening to him. Ronnie saw me from the dock and he wrote me a little note which he handed down saying, Dear Miss Lethbridge, you're more beautiful than ever. When I get out of this, I'm going to take you to the moon. And I'm quite certain that he believed it. The twins were sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, the longest murder sentence handed out by an English court. They became Britain's first celebrity convicts. Over the years, the Cray's notoriety grew into a legend. A stream of people came to visit them. I went to um, visit Ronnie in Broadmoor. After he'd been probably in for about five years, I had tea with him. And he really was the Queen Mother then. He came in and motioned one to sit down, nice table, poured the tea, very gracious host. Um, then said, um, would you like a, a meat pie? They warm them up lovely. On March the 16th, 1995, Ronnie Cray collapsed and died from a heart attack. He was 62. The twins were finally separated by death, the only thing that could come between them. Ron was given a royal funeral orchestrated from prison by his grieving twin, Reg, who was given special permission to attend. And they left from Undertaker's in Little Green Road with a horse-drawn cortege. The streets were packed as though for a royal occasion. 
Reg was very, very clever because when Ron died, he realized that what had to be done was a proper show, a proper funeral. And again, he'd read the books on the Mafia and that, you know, the Mafia funerals are something. And he was going to have the same thing. I'd never seen anything like it. It was quite extraordinary. When the twins' older brother, Charlie, died five years later, Reg once more organized the funeral from prison. It was to be a grand production, not for Charlie, but for Reg, who starred in the spectacle he'd arranged. So there was this enormous emotion going right through this crowd, the like of which I'd never seen before or since. And it came to a climax when Reg was brought in. By then he was very ill, and he was a little frail guy with grey hair. He was like some very old sort of king across the water who'd come back to his kingdom. Six months later, Reg Cray was released from prison. He had cancer and only weeks to live. He spent his last days in a small hotel room. There he was, lying in bed, death looming. And on one side was his wife, on the other side was his boyfriend. They were both holding his hands, and that's how he went out. I mean, it's just very, very odd. It's a curious... Uh, Jimmy Cagney wouldn't have done it. George Raft wouldn't have done it. But Reg did it. Reg died four days before his 67th birthday. He had spent just over 30 years in prison, a high price for fame. Funerals were incredible. They're part of the great, I suppose, the folk, folk culture of the East End, unlike anything. And again, it's you understand how clever and the power of the craze in certain ways over this whole myth. Ronnie would have done it all again, the difference between Reg and Ronnie. Ronnie would have been a gangster if you put Ronnie Cray in uh, America, France, Germany, anywhere you want, Italy. He would have been a gangster. Ronnie Cray couldn't be nothing else. In my head, Ronnie Cray, the picture of Ronnie Cray mingles in with Al Capone. I think he wanted to be Al Capone all his life. And within my head, he kind of made it to be honest. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Praise Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon. Leave a like and subscribe.